Oh, where to begin? <clears throat> what a great topic, and what an amazingly timely topic, and how cool to see the place packed so much that people have to stand. And uh, thanks for coming. It's always actually good. I'm sorry if it's a bit uncomfortable. Maybe at the halftime break, we can you know rotate people sitting and people standing. But it's great to see this measure of interest uh, in the topic. And I want to thank Prime Minister, uh, the gentleman temporarily holding the office of Prime Minister Tony <laughs> Abbott, for uh, whacking it up on the front page today, so to speak, uh, to give that kind of degree of relevance and currency. I also want to acknowledge the Gadigal mob of the Euro Nation, who's ground we are meeting on uh, and acknowledge that sovereignty over this country as across this entire continent was never ceded by the Gadigal or anybody else. I also want to acknowledge um, Jamie Parker, your and my uh, Greens MP for Balmain, and um, Jenny Leon, who's here tonight, who's going to be the first MP for Newtown. So maybe let's start with what happened today. I'm not going to put up a bunch of PowerPoint slides about the definition of metadata, but let's just do a really quick survey. Who here uses a mobile phone? All right, this affects you in that case. Uh, who uses the internet? All right, who has a bank account? All right, so this actually really does affect everybody. And the first thing I want to do is take off the table the idea that data retention is this you know, really serious, important, urgent, national security bill because its application is vastly wider. This will affect all of us in this room and I'm going to assume for the moment there may be one or two spooks in the room. Welcome if you're here, please <laughs> identify yourselves. But I'm also going to make the assumption, one hand, <laughs> I'm going to, make the, going to make the assumption that there's nobody here on, you know, who's, who's intending to conduct terrorist operations or involved necessarily in organised crime. If you are, then these tools of law enforcement and surveillance will be legitimately applied to you in a democracy. And that's the balance that we kind of struck as a democracy. We may not all agree with it, but that's where the balance currently rests. The state can intrude immensely invasively into your life if you are breaking serious laws around corruption. You know, we like the fact that ICAC can trawl MP, you know, bent MPs mobile phone numbers and work out that they're, you know, hocking themselves to the coal industry. Uh, we need some of these agencies to protect against people who, whose idea of political speech is violence and, and obviously for regular law enforcement. But that is not what this conversation is about. And let's disentangle the idea of targeted, discriminate, lawful, warranted surveillance from that of indiscriminate mass surveillance rolled across everybody who put their hands up just now, every single one of us. You know, my nephew is six and a bit years old, he's already using YouTube and stuff, why the fuck does the government think it is appropriate to be trapping and storing his online activity? Like, quite seriously, it is that degree of creepy. So disentangling the conversation immediately from the problem that I have is the, the indiscriminate nature of what is proposed here. Let's start with what happened today. Prime Minister got up this morning and pointed the finger at uh, opposition leader Bill Shorten and, and basically threatened him with an ultimatum you will support us shotgunning this uh, two-year mandatory data retention bill through the parliament. We don't know what it will cost. We don't know what the final metadata set is, so we can't yet tell the industry exactly what we want them to store. Um, we don't know even exactly how widely it will apply. Uh, we know that circumvention by anybody with a moderate amount of technical skills or even an amateurish amount of technical skills, people who are smart enough to open up a, you know, a Gmail client, will be able to circumvent um, some of the capabilities of data retention. We also know that once instituted, it will be expanded. So some of the agencies are already talking about a seven-year mandatory data retention period, but they'll settle for two, you know, to keep the peace. Um, some state police forces at least are on the record as being very keen on being able to track and store session logs, so every website that you visit. They've given that up for the moment as well, but these laws will be expanded. It's immensely difficult to wind them back. So Prime Minister has effectively stood up at this press conference with a federal police banner <coughs> and the AFP commissioner standing behind him and said, you know, I've written to you, Bill Shorten, and then I've leaked the letter to the Australian, so that's an act of good faith right there first thing in the morning. You will pass this thing uh, by mid-March, whether you like it or not, before the committee, the two uh, parliamentary committees that have been set up to analyse the bill have reported. Um, so the Prime Minister doesn't even know yet 
not even paying basic respect to the parliamentary processes that say complex, controversial legislation be submitted to these inquiries. So government chair, it's government minority, he's going to get the report he wants. At least pretend to pay respects to the process. He may not get the report that he wants out of the committee that I'm chairing, but that's, that's another thing. We might come back to that later. Um, and as effectively said, Australians are going to need, we're going to need to sacrifice our privacy right now in order to restore his failed prime ministership. Is that blunt? It's like, let's change the subject from the fact that my leadership team is in meltdown and my term as prime minister is basically terminal and stuffed and talk about the fact that unless we roll mass surveillance across the entire Australian population, people will die. It's, it's an immensely graceless and cynical bit of politics that happened this morning, and I hope people have seen right through it. You know who I hope sees right through it? Is Bill Shorten. Mm -hmm. yes. Like, that'd be a thing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, come, we'll come back to that later. All right, so we're not up for that. So really quickly, why do we think this is happening? And I, this is probably a subject actually best engaged within the Q&A, because uh, views will be as valid on this stuff uh, as, as anybody else in the room. But I think it's a complicated mix of different things. I think it is less a conscious campaign to roll totalitarian surveillance across the entire population. It is less about that. The kernel of that, unfortunately, is in there. But I personally don't believe that the motivation of those pressing this thing is that. Like, I really don't. Um, a lot of it is coming from, uh, is actually being led from the United States, where immediately after 9-11, the US National Security Agency adopted a policy which is in some of the Snowden documents in this language, in General Alexander's language, of collect it all. The doctrine will be collected all. We can't afford to be hit again. We can't afford another 9-11. We are therefore going to vacuum up every bit of signals intelligence that we can and warehouse it for later data mining and matching, and we're going to collect everything. We're not going to let a single thing slip through the net in case it's that single needle in that gargantuan haystack that, that can protect people. So you can kind of see from that point of view why they would be engaged in that mission. It's vastly unconstitutional in the United States, but of course we don't have these protections embedded in Australian law or in the Australian Constitution. So some of it is being led from that. Um, I think some of it is just incremental and it is power doing what power does. It's accumulating and it's concentrating. And it's not just about national security power, it's about concentrated economic power. Look through the WikiLeaks document drop, look through the Snowden material or material that, which is really bloody sad that, that um, Dawling's not here to tell us about it because he knows his stuff better than nearly anybody. A lot of it is used for leveraging economic power. So for what national security purpose would you say ASIS bugging the East Timorese cabinet rooms to help king commercial negotiations involving gas industry, nothing to do with national security. And that kind of stuff is actually all through the source documentation. A lot of it is about politicians and these national security powers being turned, to my mind, for entirely illegitimate ends. These two folks are going to talk in a lot more detail about how that gets turned on you and I, and civil society groups, and journalists, whistleblowers, sources. Uh, but the very argument that this is principally a national security issue is kind of blown apart by the primary source material that has been put into the public domain through the action of a series of brave whistleblowers, some of whom have already had their lives ruined for uh, taking that action on behalf of all of us. Some of it's about copyright. You know, if you are a rights holder and you want to uh, retain an extraordinarily narrow and restrictive uh, approach to distribution of content and pretend that it's still 1960 and people will wait for six months before a piece of content arrives rather than just vacuuming it down off BitTorrent, uh, rather than maybe amending the way in which you deliver content so people can get it, you would like to be able to prosecute file sharers, uh, then you'd be really interested in download volumes and who's visiting uh, you know, various uh, sites around the web. And the Federal Police Commission inadvertently gave that game away on the day that this policy was announced. It won't necessarily be the Federal Police prosecuting you unless whatever the hell we sign up to under the Trans-Pacific Partnership requires that change in law. Mm. But it will be the rights holders coming after kids in living rooms for uh, you know immense sums of money for downloading stuff that they can't get through legitimate means. So there's a thing. And I think a lot of it is about very, very local politics. When something horrific happens, our demands as a community and the demands in the media are to do something. And the politicians are told, do something. So, you know, a, a highly intrusive, real-time mass surveillance regime rolled across the whole population is something. So maybe we'll do that. 
and it's that do something imperative that I think we saw um, on quite sharp display this morning. I'm going to look tough, I'm going to stand next to a really big good looking guy from the AFP and I'm going to do something. And so are you Bill Shorten or else. It's immensely cynical politics. So what can we do? A spill might spill it. Maybe if they turf Abbott, Brandis, yes. let's just say about that guy, there are people filming, right? Okay. Uh, maybe he will go as well. And so maybe the policy might get disrupted by the extraordinary stuff that's going on inside the Liberal Party room. We shouldn't count on it, but it's a possibility. The Senate could stop it. The House of Reps won't, because the House of Reps, unfortunately, isn't all that representative. Uh, but the Senate might, because the numbers are so finely balanced. So we've got uh, 10 Greens, who are pretty good, so you don't need to worry about lobbying um, Richard. Uh, can if you want. He'd love to hear from you. Um, we need three out of eight of the cross benches. So people like Nick Xenophon, uh, Mr. Lionhelm, Senator Lionhelm, I think you guys elected, didn't you? What were you thinking? <laughs> but, uh, oh, my name. Didn't break the law, legitimately elected, and really good on this stuff. Very strange on other stuff. Really strange. But uh, genuinely of good heart uh, on, you know, the intrusive power of the state. That's two votes. So we need one more. Uh, of those eight, and so hopefully we will get one of those. Feel free to uh, call any of those other crossbenchers and have a bit of a yarn, which leaves 25 votes still to get, and that's exactly the number of ALP senators that sit in your Senate at the moment, some of them from New South Wales. Not evil people, and they are going to need to hear from you, and so is Bill Shorten. So actually, I know it sounds a little bit corny and parliamentary, and not all that direct action-y. These two are going to take care of that portfolio. However, if you can persuade the ALP to show some spine and not be treated like garbage, as they were this morning on this issue, it actually can be stopped in the Senate. And we can have a smarter conversation then about getting a warrant, about actual reforms that would protect people, rather than continually running these piecemeal defensive campaigns. Stop the net filter, stop data retention, stop this copyright absurdity. We need to actually talk about a proper digital rights manifesto that protects the medium and protects us as human beings operating in it. And we don't deserve any less than that. It's hard to have that conversation while these piecemeal defensive fights are happening. We've been uh, discussing the most powerful communications medium in human history, like we really have. Don't let them ruin it, but let's use its power to connect us to each other in its own defence and in our defence. Because we can walk out of this room tonight and it's really unlikely that there'll be guys in white vans picking us up and taking us away. We couldn't hold this meeting in China or Burma. So let's use the agency that we have to defend the freedoms that we have from people who are actually consciously or subconsciously eroding them by the day. And it's the boiling frog thing, isn't it? It happens a bit at a time. But um, I know Facebook is, is loathsome, and I apologize for that. But put your hands up if you use it. Come on. It's loathsome, but we use it. I use it for work. Uh, and for the articles. Um, <laughs> but it's there, right? So collectively, um, between all of us and all of the people that we know on Facebook, that might conservatively be around 10,000 people. I don't know if that's an accurate guess or not. I don't know, how many are we tonight? We're like 160 or something? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, multiply that out by everybody who you could reach on Facebook, but then multiply that out by everybody they could reach. Because they would have just got a communication from someone they love and trust, you know, not a politician, but a friend or someone, you know, in their family. They're much more likely to share that. And then suddenly you're talking hundreds of thousands of people and into the low millions of people. And that's kind of what I mean, like using the connected nature of the medium. Face to face, I think, is still <coughs> king in politics. It's still where it happens. It's still what actually matters. But the power of this medium, I think, shouldn't be forgotten. As long as you don't mind being put on some lists when you're signing petitions and that kind of stuff. Oh yeah, cue nervous laughter. Okay, I'm going to stop at that. Uh, and we'll come back in the Q&A, but again, thanks so much for being here tonight. I'm looking forward more to hearing what these two have to say.